Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. All right, this is episode 274. This week is going to be a short episode. I had a lot of events going on this week and not a whole lot of time. So we are going to have a shorter episode. Again, like I said, next week we are going to have a really cool talk we had with Frater O about some current research and books we're reading, which was a really great conversation and went in a really interesting direction. And then, normally, we'd be dark for two weeks. However, we do have a special Christmas episode that Brother Adam Thayer did for us. And so we will have a show that will go up on Christmas Day. So we're really looking forward to that. And then we will be dark for the new year and back again uh, shortly after. So only one week without an episode, which should be pretty cool. We won't again, uh, January 1st is a Sunday. So the next time you'll hear from me after the Adam Thayer episode on Christmas Day will be the 8th of January. So we're really looking forward to that. And that's about it. So in the news this week, not a lot has been going on aside from just wanted to quickly mention our show sponsor. This episode of Whence Came You is brought to you by MasonicRevival.com. That's a Masonic design group bringing you the latest fashion trends and Masonic accessories and regalia. You can check out their newest neckties, aprons, and accessories at MasonicRevival.com. And with that, we're going to go into this week's piece. So what I really wanted to do with this piece was to just read it because so many brothers around the internet were posting about this and a lot of guys were really feeling the death of uh, an American icon and of course I'm talking about brother John Glenn the rocket man just after he passed away illustrious brother Todd E. Crease an original founder of the Midnight Freemasons decided he would post the entire chapter that he had on brother John Glenn in his book Famous American Freemasons volume two and so for you right now i'd like to read that chapter as a tribute to brother john glenn in memory of brother john glenn rocket man i don't know what you could say about a day in which you have seen four beautiful sunsets john glenn 1921 2016 this is the chapter entitled rocket man from my 2007 book Famous American Freemasons, Volume 2. On a beautiful summer day, a father took his eight-year-old son to work with him. They were driving to check out the future plumbing job. On the way back home, they drove by a rural airport where an old biplane sat on a nearby field. The father and the son decided to stop and check it out, and the pilot, wearing the typical helmet and goggles, was taking people for rides in the plane. The father asked his son if he wanted to go up. You mean it? The boy replied. The father had wanted to fly ever since he'd seen biplanes fighting over the lines during World War I. His young son shared his enthusiasm. After the father handed the pilot a few dollars, they climbed into the back of the cockpit and sat side by side in the small seat, hooking a strap across them both. The engine revved. They bounced down the runway until suddenly they were in the air. The young boy couldn't believe how high they climbed. When the plane banked, they could look straight down. As an elderly man, he still remembers that evening on the ground looked small, like the buildings and trees on a train set in a store window. From that day forward, the boy was hooked on airplanes. Years later, as a young man, he was flying over North Korea. He was in a steep diving run in an F-9F Panther, targeting a complex of buildings being used by the communists for the staging of equipment and soldiers. When he saw, off to his right, the tracer bullets from a communist anti-aircraft emplacement streaming past him, he made a mental note of the location. After dropping his bomb load, he swung low over the trees, then instead of returning to base, he made a turn toward the anti-aircraft guns that had fired on him. Flying low and fast, he drew down on the emplacement. Firing his four 20mm cannons, he watched as the shells ripped the enemy emplacement apart. He had only a brief moment of satisfaction as he pulled up, fly over the emplacement he'd just destroyed. Suddenly, something struck the plane. He started to roll over and down toward the rice paddy. He was unable to climb to altitude, and it took tremendous strength to control the badly damaged aircraft. Being so close to the ground, his first problem was to keep from crashing. His second was to avoid more anti-aircraft fire coming from the hilltops. He was able to wrestle the plane back to base. After he landed safely, he was surprised to find one hole in the panther's tail, big enough to put my head and shoulders through, John Glenn reminisced, along with another 250 smaller shrapnel holes. That evening, he wrote a poem that, in part, went, quote, Then off to one side of the tail, a tracer stream did pass. A thought ran flashing through my mind. They're shooting at my ass, end quote. 
unbelievably, the tail of the panther was replaced. She flew again like new, and so would he. A week later, he was hit again during a napalm run. As he was gliding to the target at about 8,000 feet, he felt a tremendous explosion. His plane tipped over 90 degrees to the left. The other pilots radioed him, telling him he'd been hit. Quote, something I was already keenly aware of, he recalled. He was able to control the plane and return to base where he was shocked to discover a two-foot hole in the wing from a large anti-aircraft shell. In addition to that hole, the ground crew counted another 300 holes from shrapnel, but this pilot had escaped without a scratch. Because of his gift for attracting so much flack from anti-aircraft fire, his squadron began calling him, quote, Old Magnet a- End quote. He flew 63 combat missions during his first tour in Korea. He would go on to fly 27 more in an F-86 Sabre during his second tour, and in the last nine days of the Korean War, he shot down three MiG-15s. But it was a flight years later, a flight that lasted 4 hours, 55 minutes, and 23 seconds that made this man famous. It was a flight even more dangerous than any mission he'd flown over Korea, a historic flight that was not even in a plane. On February 20th, 1962, at 9.47 a.m., the roar of a 125-ton Atlas rocket broke the silence of Cape Canaveral and signaled the launch of a mission that would demonstrate to the world that America was still in the space race. At a top speed of 17,545 miles per hour, one man was rocketed into the history books. As the rocket roared toward space, Scott Carpenter put into words from Mission Control what most people were feeling as they watched the historic moment on television all over the world. Godspeed, John Glenn. Aboard the Friendship 7, John Glenn became the first American astronaut to orbit the Earth. John Herschel Glenn Jr. was born on July 18, 1921 in Cambridge, Ohio. His father was a railroad conductor who became a proprietor of a plumbing and heating business. John Glenn and his sister Jean grew up in North Concord, Ohio, a small college town a few miles from the larger city of Zanesville. As a teenager, Glenn was active in sports, winning letters in basketball, football, and tennis at New Concord High School. He earned high grades, served as president of his junior class, and played the lead role in his senior class play. After graduating in the spring of 1939, he enrolled at Muskegon College, a Presbyterian liberal arts college in New Concord. Glenn played football at Muskegon College and continued to perform well in the classroom majoring in chemistry. In 1941, he received his private pilot's license to earn course credits in physics. When the the United States entered World War II after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Glenn enlisted in the United States Army Air Corps. But when the Army did not call him up, he enlisted in the United States Navy as an aviation cadet. He was trained at Naval Air Station in Olathe, where he made his first solo flight in a military aircraft. While receiving advanced training at Naval Air Station Corpus Christi in 1943, he was reassigned to the United States Marine Corps. On March 31, 1943, he became a commissioned officer in the the U.S. Marine Corps and was promoted to first lieutenant six months later. Lieutenant Glenn married Anna Castor in April of 1943. Later, they had two children, Carolyn and David. In February of 1944, John Glenn received orders to go to the Pacific as part of the Marine Fighter Squadron 155. During the next year, he flew 59 missions in the Marshall Island Campaign, attacking anti-aircraft emplacements and making bombing runs in his F-4U Corsair. Glenn was transferred back to the States in July of 1945, where he became a captain at Naval Air Station, Paddockson River, Maryland. Glenn remained in the Marines after the war ended, serving as a member of the VMF 218. He flew patrol missions in North Korea until his unit was relocated to Guam. He became a flight instructor at Naval Air Station Corpus Christi, Texas in 1948, and later attended amphibious warfare school. After he was promoted to major, he received the assignment to Korea. After the Korean War ended, Glenn worked as a test pilot, serving as an armament officer. He flew high-altitude weapons tests of machine guns and cannons, but his most remarkable accomplishment came on July 16, 1957, when he became the first pilot to complete the supersonic transcontinental flight. He flew a Vought F-88U-1 Crusader plane from Los Angeles to Floyd Bennett Field in New York in three hours, 23 minutes, and 8 seconds. One story is that Glenn flew over his hometown of New Concord, Ohio. The tremendous sonic boom that followed his jet shook the town. A neighborhood child ran to the Glenn house shouting, Johnny dropped a bomb! Johnny dropped a bomb! Johnny dropped a bomb! The achievement not only set a new record, but also earned Glenn his fifth 
Distinguished Flying Cross. Later, he was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. In 1959, John Glenn received word that he'd been selected for training as one of the original group of the Mercury astronauts in the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. In May of 1959, seven astronauts began training at Langley Research Center. In May and July 1961, Alan Shepard and Virgil Grissom respectively became the first and second astronauts actually launched into space. John Glenn's mission, however, was not only to escape Earth's atmosphere and return, but also to orbit the Earth. On February 20th, 1962, Friendship 7 was launched into orbit with Glenn at the controls. The many Americans and others around the world who watched the launch didn't know there was a very serious problem. NASA officials feared that the heat shield on Friendship 7 had been damaged during the launch, but there was nothing that could be done to inspect or repair it. There was only hope and prayer that the damage was not so severe as to cause Glenn to burn up during re-entry. To the relief of NASA, John Glenn splashed down safely. Celebrated as a national hero, he received a ticker tape parade reminiscent of Charles A. Lindbergh's after his completion of the first transcontinental flight 35 years before. Despite Glenn's success and celebrity, he didn't go into space again, although he wanted to. It has been long believed that John F. Kennedy himself may have blocked Glenn from flying future missions, most notably the Gemini and Apollo missions, because the loss of a national hero of John Glenn's stature could have seriously harmed the fledgling NASA space program, or even ended the the manned space program altogether. Glenn remained close friends with the Kennedy family, but two years after his historic flight, he left the space program and retired from the Marine Corps. After considering a career in politics, he opted instead to accept a corporate position as vice president of Royal Crown Cola International Limited. Still interested in politics, he supported Robert Kennedy's 1968 presidential run. In fact, he was with Robert Kennedy when he was assassinated. Finally, in 1974, John Glenn entered politics. He ran in a bitterly fought election for Ohio Senator and won. It was the beginning of Glenn's career as Ohio State Senator that would last 24 years. Glenn made a bid to be vice president with Jimmy Carter in 1976, but Carter selected Walter Mondale as his running mate. Glenn ran in the 1984 presidential election. He polled well in the beginning, running a close second to Walter Mondale, but because he was hesitant to use his fame as an astronaut and an American hero, his candidacy fizzled. The failed presidential bid left Glenn with a substantial campaign debt that took him years to pay off. In 1998, John Glenn decided to retire, declining to run for re-election to the United States. State Senate. At age 77, John Glenn deserved the rest, but he wasn't quite ready to be put out to pasture. On October 29th, 1998, the roar of rocket engines broke the silence of Kennedy Space Center in Florida as the space shuttle Discovery lifted off for a historic mission. Seven-man crew included the first Spanish astronaut, Pedro Duque. It also included a 77-year-old payload specialist and recently retired senator from Ohio who had been, incidentally, the first American to orbit the Earth. 36 years after his first flight aboard Friendship 7, John Glenn returned to space for a nine-day mission for which he'd trained hard, both physically and mentally. Glenn was a member of the crew, as well as one of the experiments, which tested the effects of spaceflight on the aging. He was a perfect subject since his extensive medical records from his days during the early years of NASA provided a baseline for the testing. Upon returning from his discovery mission, John Glenn received the same national attention and praise he'd received after his historic flight aboard Friendship 7. He is the only man to receive two ticker tape parades in his lifetime. Even so, he remained humbled by the experience, stating, quote, You know old folks can have dreams too, as well as young folks, and then work toward them. And to have a dream like this come true for me is just a terrific experience. End quote. The illustrious John Glenn originally petitioned his hometown lodge in Concord Lodge number 688 of New Concord, Ohio in 1964. He was elected to receive the degrees of masonry, however, his increasingly busy life made it impossible for him to receive those degrees at the time. Even so, he continued to desire admission in Concord Lodge 14 years later on August 19, 1978. John Glenn was finally able to finish what he began in 1964. At the Chillicothe High School Gymnasium with hundreds of master masons present, John Glenn received the Master Mason degree in a special meeting. After the Master of Scioto Lodge No. 6 opened the lodge, he turned the meeting over to Grand Master of Ohio Jerry C. Rasner, who in turn opened the Grand Lodge of Ohio, who conferred the degrees. On April 11, 1997, Brother John Glenn received 
further light in masonry at the Valley of Cincinnati when he received the Scottish Rite degrees. He later received the highest Scottish Rite honor on September 10, 1998, when he was conferred with the 33rd degree of masonry. Several of his friends from Washington, D.C. attended the event. Senate colleagues, brothers Charles Grassley and Conrad Burns were present, as was a former Ohio congressman, brother Clarence Brown Jr. of the Valley of Dayton. It might be interesting to note that there are two topics deemed inappropriate to discuss in a lodge of Freemasons because they are topics that divide men instead of unite them, religion and politics. This ideal is obviously something John Glenn very much believes in. The three friends that joined Brother Glenn at the conferral of his 33rd degree were Republicans. John Glenn has been a lifelong Democrat. The Scottish Rite again honored Brother Glenn in 2007 in Washington, D.C. when they awarded him the prestigious Gorgas Medal. Toddy Creason, 33rd degree. There you have it, a really, really cool memorial and the entire chapter on John Glenn from illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison's book, Famous American Freemasons, Volume 2. If you're interested in that, please check our website. Click on the bookstore where it will give you a link to the Amazon page where that book is. Now, the book that we do have linked is Volume 1 and 2 together. I think it's a great buy. I have a copy of it myself. It is a great reference when you're trying to figure out a little bit of information on some famous American Freemasons. Again, with that, uh, I'm just going to please remind you all to check out our lapel pins on the limited edition shop on wcypodcast.com. Please don't forget about our show sponsors, including Masonic Revival, On It Labs with Alpha Brain, as well as Banker's Best and The Winding Stairs. If you don't want to do any shopping, support us that way. Please just consider making a one time or a reoccurring monthly donation to the show. It helps keep the show running, keeps lights on, keeps these things recording. If something ever happens to the computer we use to record these things, any of the equipment, if it ever breaks, that's where we pull the funds from. So please consider that, and I hope you guys all have an amazing week as we lead up into Christmas. Please do remember, again, tonight's episode I do realize was late I do apologize for that, uh, but please do remember, the 18th, we will have a really cool episode, hopefully with Frater O. I have to finish putting that one together. We've got an episode for Christmas Day. I know we we would be dark on the 25th and the 1st of January. However, we do have a Christmas episode, Brother Adam Thayer put together for us, so we're excited about that. That'll be coming out on the 25th on Christmas Day, so that's cool. We won't have a show for January 1, but we will be back on the 8th. So we do have shows. The only time will be dark is January 1. Check that out. Uh, if you do love Masonic podcasts, and I, you gotta love them because you're listening to this one, please don't forget about the Masonic Roundtable going live every Tuesday night, 10, 9 central. And if you love reading cool Masonic articles, don't forget about the Midnight Freemasons, where we have three articles every single week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. With that, I hope you guys, again, have an amazing week. Stay on the level. For Wednesday Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition. 